Well, the meeting is being recorded. Let's all stand for the pledge. Face a uh, Haldane flagpole. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice liberty for all. And justice for all. President Daly? Here. Vice President McNall? Here. Trustee Clements? Here. Trustee Valentine? Here. And Trustee Headland is unavailable tonight. Thank you, Ms. Platt. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, doing a, a quick pivot. We are meeting via Zoom um, simply for a couple of precautions. Um, but we fully expect to be back um, in person on January 4th, 2021, our uh, next scheduled board meeting at 7 p.m. Um, in the small gym auditorium. Uh, so I will turn it over to Dr. Benante for his comments. Thanks, Jen. I'll try to keep my comments brief this evening since I know our administrative team's here and uh, we have a couple of special presentations. Uh, just one note I wanted to make at the start of our meeting, I will have some comments to close as well, uh, was related to um, in, in anticipation that the county uh, will begin to allow uh, for a test to stay policy uh, for students in quarantine um, at some point in the near future. Uh, if you're keeping tabs on this, the uh, CDC has now recommended or endorsed test to stay policies uh, surrounding counties have implemented them, I'd say with mixed results. Um, and the mixed results is it can be helpful to keeping kids in school who are otherwise quarantined or would be quarantined. Uh, it's proving to be quite the logistical uh, endeavor um, for, for schools that have already implemented these policies in Westchester in particular. Uh, but I do think that after the break, uh, we will see uh, some movement on this and we'll examine as a district implementing a policy once the county fully endorses it um, in sometime in the next few weeks. So uh, with the holidays approaching, we are asking uh, folks to uh, be vigilant um, and we're encouraging families to the extent that it's possible to consider having your child tested uh, for COVID prior to returning him or her to school. Uh, in January. So we think that uh, would be very helpful to us. Um, and we've communicated such to families. And obviously, we're hopeful that everyone has a very safe holiday and is mindful of um, uh, mindful of uh, taking precautions as it relates to public health and nobody falls ill. Uh, but it is still a time where we're seeing a lot of illness in the community um, uh, related to COVID and we want to do our best to keep our school open. So uh, our intentions are to come back uh, right after the new year. Uh, but I will be communicating to families uh, that uh, we're going to be keeping an eye on this over the next couple of weeks. And um, some districts uh, have been forced to close prior to break. Uh, we're hopeful that we'll be able to open after break. But uh, we very well may well uh, find ourselves in a position where we have to go remote after break. Uh, we don't know. Um, hopefully illness will stay contained and that won't be the case, uh, but it's something we'll be working on uh, through the holiday. So uh, that concludes uh, my remarks for now. Uh, if there's any questions on that, I'll pause. Uh, and if not, I'll move on to my uh, one of my presentations. Any questions from the board? I think we're, we're good. Keep, yeah. keep on going. Yeah, plenty there. <laughs> um, I did want to just spend a few minutes this evening talking about the budget parameters for the upcoming school year. Uh, I This is something we typically do in early December. We just had uh, have some busy, have had some busy agendas. So I did not get to this uh, quite uh, last uh, meeting. So I'm going to just share my screen. Again, I continue to announce that. It's been some time since we've had a webinar. Uh, okay, so typically at this point in the school year, uh, we begin to go through some parameters for budget development that guides the administration as we start to construct next year's budget, which we really get uh, in some uh, serious work with come, come January. So we have some information at this point, but as you know, the state budget is nowhere near complete. Uh, so there are some, some gaps that we have to fill throughout the budget development process. 
Uh, I just want to start with where we left off at the end of last school year, beginning of this school year. You'll recall that voters approved a 1.8% increase to the levy in May. However, when it came time to set the final tax rate, which occurs in the summer, the final assessment resulted in a net 0.58% uh, increase to the tax levy. So that's good news for our taxpayers in our community. While they approved a 1.8% to the levy, the actual impact on their tax bill for this upcoming school year was about uh, six tenths of a percent. And I think this is an area we've done really well with over the last couple of years in keeping the tax levy quite low, um, uh, lower than what the voters actually approve in May um, due to um, some functions that are outside of our control, some that are. Um, as we go into this school year, we can anticipate an increase to foundation aid. This was good news that we left off on uh, towards the end of last school year with a commitment through the legislature and the governor's office to fully restore foundation aid. So you'll see these figures reflected uh, over the last five years here, uh, along with the increase from the prior year's foundation aid amount. And you can see that this year, uh, we realized an increase in foundation aid of about $136,000. Uh, we anticipate another increase going into this year's budget development for next school year of $113,000. As you can see in previous years, these were uh, the foundation aid was frozen um, uh, or we received a very modest increase. So um, having these increases uh, are... Uh, better news than what we've had in the past, certainly. We're beginning to see other figures uh, come in at this point that can give us, uh, again, if you think of this next month uh, or two as filling in some gaps in our budget uh, or factors that influence our budget, our health premium increases are projected at 6%. That's pretty uh, significant. Um, we do belong in a consortium and part of that is to keep costs uh, low, but uh, healthcare costs continue to rise and our premium is going to increase to 6%. You know, it's something that we should uh, keep an eye on. Uh, the TRS projection uh, is at 10.5% at an estimate. This is a slight increase uh, from last year where we were at 9.8. Again, this is a TRS contribution on all um, teaching salaries or instructional staff salaries in the district. The ERS rate will decrease from 16% to 11.6%. Um, as a reminder, employees who are in the ERS system, our, our maintenance and operations staff, our uh, clerical staff are all part of the ERS system. And we're still awaiting BOCES uh, budget information for the upcoming school year. Uh, so again, still very early on, uh, these figures will uh, begin to come more, become more clear to us as we go through the budget development process and we provide information to the board on a somewhat continual basis once we get into January. As I said last year, uh, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. So we want to be mindful as we go into budget development for the upcoming year of some of our strategic priorities uh, as they relate to our strategic coherence planning goals and areas. Uh, so whether it be curriculum alignment, uh, professional learning, how we establish goals for students, how we service our vulnerable populations within our student population, uh, these are all things that should be at the fore of our planning process for budget development. So as we go into uh, budget development, these are the uh, parameters that I'm presenting to the board for consideration. We don't need to make any decisions on this tonight. Uh, we will leave some room for discussion. Uh, the board has been good about developing a budget to the levy limit or endorsing developing a budget to the levy limit um, each school year. And I think as you've seen, even though we've developed a budget up to that limit, uh, it has not necessarily resulted in an actual uh, tax increase to that amount, especially over these last two years. Uh, uh, the amount of taxes our community is uh, uh, paying is actually lower than uh, what we're levying or what they're approving in June. And I think that's good news. Um, and again, try, trying to strike a balance and having a, a really uh, 
a good school system that provides good programmatic opportunities for our students, but at the same time being mindful that it comes at a cost to our community. Uh, maintaining all existing programs is something that we've had as a parameter in previous years. However, the board has asked in the past, well, what would it take to include um, or to, uh, to include new programs uh, or new additions into our budget? And I've included three areas here that I, I know we have discussed with the board uh, that I feel a responsibility now going into this budget cycle. This will be the fourth one we've lived together and the last couple have been heavily influenced by COVID, but of providing you with cost outlines uh, for uh, certain programmatic areas that seem to continue to receive a lot of our attention. Uh, so literacy at the elementary level and how we design uh, our literacy model at the elementary level is uh, there's, there's room there, uh, or there may be room there for us to continue to consider programmatic additions in this area, uh, including uh, further additions to our intervention model. School scheduling is something I know I've discussed. I think some of our administrators have brought up as well some of the limits of our current school scheduling model. Uh, we have three schools all on one campus. Uh, we share staff between those schools and those schools are on three different schedules. Uh, and that presents some real, um, some issues for us uh, throughout the year. So this might be a good budget development to put some things in place to begin to address that issue. Uh, lastly, the board has heard from our community and the board has asked questions uh, themselves about our special education model, uh, K through eight in particular, our co-teaching model. Uh, and again, as we're going into this budget development uh, process, I do feel that uh, a bit of a responsibility to provide uh, an outline of the cost associated with potentially expanding this model at the K-8 level for the board's consideration and discussion, and then ultimately direction on whether the administration should include um, a change in this area in next year's budget. Now, there are other areas that I think are important to the board or to our community that you may want me to consider as uh, in the administration to consider as we go into budget development. And we don't, again, need to make all those decisions now, but I do think that the administration between this evening and uh, early next month, our first meeting, uh, certainly by our second meeting, we should wait no longer than that. Uh, I would need to hear from the board by then uh, whether or not there's any other program areas you want us to consider um, for inclusion or consideration to include in next year's budget development. These are just a few that I recall from uh, our discussions over the last few years. Uh, there may be others that you want me to consider. So um, that's something that, uh, Jen, we can talk a little bit about now, uh, or we could just agree that we'll revisit this as we come back into session um, after the new year. And that's it for this evening. So I'll, I'll pause there to see if there's any questions or discussion that we want to have now. No, I just wanted to, um, I, I believe you, when we talked about the maintain all existing programs last year, um, I think what you said is accurate, that the board wanted to create a little bit of space for the administration to not feel like everything needs yep. to quote, stay the same. Yep. Um, and that does mean, you know, the potential for new programs. But I, I feel like the board also communicated that perhaps some programs that we currently uh, use, we don't need to keep using, or you know, we don't need to keep doing. So it's not just about implementing new programs. It might also be about um, shifting away from current programs that we're using. So I just wanted to be clear. I, I believe that's what the board um, kind of shared last year that we really wanted to create some space for the administration to feel like they don't need to just do what we always do. I hear you. Thanks, Jen, for clarifying that. Yeah. Bill, could you talk a little bit more about the scheduling and give like a specific example um, for us lay people out here? What do you mean by, sure. you know, some of the, the scheduling issues? Sure. Uh, and I, I'll invite, since the principals happen to be on, uh, they could share some of the particulars as it relates to shared staff. But um, when you consider that our staff are um, a special area teacher, for example, may teach elementary sections and may teach also some secondary sections. Well, those are two different schools that run on two different schedules. Uh, so the length of day 
um, for our teaching staff is defined in their contract, but the length of those days, again, uh, secondary starts earlier than elementary. So what we have to be mindful of contractual parameters when we're uh, just deploying our staff in particular in, 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 in the special areas um, because their, the length of their workday is defined by their contract. Uh, but at the same time, when they're going between a, a secondary schedule that may run on a, on a bell schedule, uh, if you will, um, uh, and then an elementary schedule that doesn't, um, we, we, we lose flexibility there uh, to use them in the most effective and efficient way we can. Uh, so it's not uncommon to see, to have seen in the past, I, I, uh, where our special area teachers may have some pretty big gaps in their schedule, meaning they're full time, uh, but on a given day, they may not actually be uh, teaching as many classes uh, as we could because we simply couldn't make the schedules line up in a way uh, that, that works. Uh, you'll note, Maggie, that um, at the beginning of the school year, and it, this isn't an issue that will solve all of this, but we, we do approve a number of six period assignments. Uh, for our teachers. Uh, some of those six period assignments are driven by the fact that our schedules just don't line up in a way uh, that allow us to uh, create a course or run a course at a time that we know our students uh, can take it, uh, but those teachers don't have the flexibility in their schedule to, uh, because of, again, they might be split um, uh, or navigating other uh, things that means we just have to, um, uh, we just have to make it available through uh, the addition of a six period assignment. So. Um, those are some of the uh, some of the issues we see. Um, there's others uh, that we could drill down to, but just uh, as the start of that, that's something that um, we encountered. Does that does that help? And uh, yeah, definitely gives sort of a <clears throat> a foundation there. Um, but in terms of so, what where were the costs come? And again, a you know basic question. But in terms of the costs and and putting money from yeah. the budget into this, is that hiring more teachers? Is it no. spending more time thinking about the scheduling? Yeah, it's a, it's a consultant to facilitate the work. Um, so uh, I do think that when it comes to school scheduling, we could try to do this, our, uh, you know, go at it, go it alone. Um, I would not advise that we do so because there's so many intricacies uh, to our, each of our buildings that to try to, you know, get our administrators and a few of our teachers in a room to work it all out, it would come at a, a significant um, amount of time. And I just think that there's people out there who do this work. They work with school districts, uh, you know, across either nationally, certainly regionally, who are pretty adept and, and have either programs or a mind that they could just take all of our parameters and, you know, go and work with it and come back with a product that uh, will largely address all of our issues. And it's not a, a huge cost. It's not something that would drive the budget. Uh, but anytime you're bringing in a consultant that may be working with our, our staff in such a way, um, I, you know, I think we want the board to uh, endorse that um, uh, and uh, uh, before we get into it, because I think it, um, uh, uh, it does come at us. It, it is a more significant investment than, than other consultants we, we may work with throughout the year. So that's where the budget uh, uh, piece would come in. I that's one I, th I think we can, you know, we can get done. Uh, some of the other costs that are more staff dependent, as we talk about reading, as we talk about special education, those are much more significant costs. Uh, the scheduling piece is just one we've, we keep hitting on in our discussions. And I, I'd be remiss, I feel like, if I didn't mention that that's on our, on our radar as we go into budget development. And Dr. Benante, did that come up in another study we did? Remind me of which one it was. Was it the demographic study or there was a a building study and, and the this, this scheduling was like earmarked as an issue. I think it's come up in almost every study it's we've every done. Study. I feel like it's recently and they- <laughs> Yeah, it's in our, you know, I mentioned the HR audit, it's in there. It's uh, anybody who's kind of come in to work with us uh, and examined uh, staffing in any way, um, whether it be how our, how our buildings are staffed, you're, you referenced the enrollment study, uh, Jen, that was a component of that. Space utilization was a component of the enrollment and demographic study. The HR audit, obviously, there's a staffing component there. Everyone has uh, uh, alluded, and, and this is good because it's a good kind of uh, independent measure. People who do not work with each other, you know, who serve as very much an independent auditor uh, on, on our system have all brought up the, the school scheduling piece. And even our own internal folks would, would point to it and say, yeah, that's, that's something that uh, needs to be reexamined.
So with that, over the next few weeks, I'll, I'll just await hearing from the board if there's any further areas that the board would like the administration to consider uh, in budget development as we go into this, uh, this cycle. Okay. Uh, Jen, with that, um, I'll transition uh, to Ms. Jammon. Ms. Jammon is here this evening. I see you're still in your office, Ms. Jammon, uh, <laughs> um, to uh, provide the elementary school detail report. Uh, Christine, I do believe you have the ability to share your screen. Uh, please let me know if you don't. There you go. All right. Yes, I'm still here. I didn't trust my Wi-Fi or my children um, to stay well behaved. Through, <laughs> through the presentation tonight. Uh, I'm not sure whether my children or my Wi-Fi is more misbehaved, it depends on the day. So um, thank you for having me here for the elementary detail report. We're much earlier in the year than the last detail report. So um, some of the information I would have had to share last year, we're not yet there in this school year, but we'll go through what we have uh, in December. So our building goals this year, we had three building goals. The first was to support collaboration between teachers as we look at the strategic coherence plan and our housing essentials. Um, last year, we had worked with a unit design template and we had a number of teachers who worked with Judy Barbera and Angela Lawler to um, utilize a unit plan template that incorporated the healthy and essentials and they gave feedback on that unit plan template, as well as a year overview um, document that we were using and that they helped develop. Uh, over the summer, we had some fourth and fifth grade teachers, Mr. Dudar, Ms. Newman, and Mr. Bernstein, who did summer curriculum work using that unit plan template and work on how to assess the healthy and essentials within their work. So then as we entered this year, we have been using our superintendent's conference days. Um, every teacher in the district, we set a district goal to have all of our teachers, when they did their personal goal work as part of their APPR plan, to incorporate a goal around either using the unit plan or the how they essentials and how they would incorporate that in their work in their classroom. Um, and then we've talked at faculty meetings during breakout rooms about any difficulties that people are having or things that are going well with incorporation of the Haldane Essentials. And we are mid progress in some mandatory uh, after school um, staff development where the teachers have had a chance to work with their grade level partners um, or faculty members of their choice if there was a cross curricular or cross grade level um, endeavor that they were working on. Um, so some after school time for them to work on those plans and we have two more of those coming up um, as we enter winter and spring for our teachers to work together and use time um, to work on those two pieces. So our students, um, these are just some photos of some classroom anchor charts and classroom rubrics that are being used with our students. So there's a communication rubric that the students are helping to develop and use as they do their work, some anchor charts on communication, problem solving, growth mindset, and then some work that students are doing where they had to communicate, work together, problem solve, um, and the teachers are incorporating all of those essentials and trying to think about it in a systemic way that will increase K-12 alignment over time as we continue this work as a district. Our second building goal was to develop a building-wide understanding um, and common language, especially for students around the Haldane essentials. So part of that work has been pushing into classrooms to use literacy um, to build discussion within students and classrooms or between students and in their classrooms around the themes of books and um, having them think about what those books talk show them 
when it comes to the kind of school we want, how we want to communicate with each other, how we want to treat each other, um, how we can get better at this over time. And so um, there are six themes we're exploring through literacy as I push into classrooms. The first was creating a welcoming school. Um, so six different books were read with students where they could examine what happened in the book and discuss, is that the kind of school we want? Some of the books gave examples of a positive school community, others showed conflict, and what kind of a school did we want? So those classroom discussions were our first discussions of the year. Um, managing feelings and conflict is the second theme, then respecting other people and their value and contribution to our school. Mistakes and how they can help us learn and grow and how that ties into a growth mindset and also emotional intelligence and wellness encountering problems and how we can see them as opportunities for growth and learning. And then believing in yourself will be the final theme of the year. And then the last building goal was to transition to our new MTSS plan. So uh, Ms. Rounds and I presented that plan to the board in September. It was adopted by the board. And now it's rolling out the changes in practices that um, are part of that plan so that we are implementing it over the school year. Um, so we started the school year uh, with new entry and exit criteria that were laid out in that plan. Um, adjusting them for any new data that we got um, as we entered the school year. We've had two building-wide data meetings at the elementary, one after the first administration of the NWEA, and then one after the first report cards went home uh, for our data team to examine any trends or data that we saw within those two, um, within those two assessments. We also have a new interventionist and a new behaviorist. So an MTSS plan, as we talked about in September, talks about academic supports for students, but also those social emotional supports for students. So um, we have also been transitioning in Ms. Fondon as our new behaviorist and using her input and experiences to build our social emotional support. Uh, we have all of our related service professionals, as well as our TAs, trained in safety care, which increases their ability to support our students socially and emotionally. Um, and then with our academics, we added uh, Ms. Pastula as an additional interventionist on top of uh, Ms. Saunders, who's already been working with our students K-5 in past years. So adding Ms. Pastula has been wonderful. Um, Ms. Fawn was a new behaviorist but not a new position. We had a different behaviorist in last year. Ms. Pastula's position is a new position. So we didn't have her working with students in this capacity last year. She was working with remote students, but not as an interventionist for tier two or tier three students. So part of our MTSS plan was that we identified that it would be a district priority to ensure that our students who struggled with literacy had the support of a certified teacher rather than a teaching assistant, which in um, some cases was how our staffing worked out in previous years. So by having two certified teachers working as interventionists, we have 36, 37 students working with a certified teacher in the area of literacy. Whereas in past years, we had about 20 students working with a certified teacher and then other students working with a teaching assistant under that teacher's supervision. So we've almost doubled our number of students that have direct uh, support by a certified professional. Um, our, these are our current student reading levels outside of kindergarten. So the kindergarten one I'll talk about in a second. For our other grade levels, you can see that we have um, about 15% approximately of our students are reading below grade level. It varies slightly between grades. Um, and those students are then working with those certified teachers. I think if we add those up, you get to 39, um, 39 students. We have 37 working with teachers right now. And there are a few of them that are getting support from special education teachers as well. So those teachers, those students are getting direct support. Our kindergarten number there 
is higher than normal. Um, and the reason for that is that that is the September assessment for our kindergartners. And we do have more kindergartners this year that didn't attend preschool last year due to the pandemic. And so they came in with um, more gaps in their, in their understanding. But that number doesn't reflect well our number of kindergartners who struggle what we saw as we moved into September and October is a lot of those students were below grade level just because of exposure. And as they were exposed to those topics with their teachers, they are quickly closing that gap and learning the letter IDs, the sounds and the things that we're putting them behind. We do have some of our kindergartners working in an intense tier one support with a certified teacher or TA. Um, and we'll have a better idea of those gaps as. Um, we do the NWEA and winter assessments in January. So our students will get some additional reading assessments as well as the NWEA as we move into this next part of the year. We just, that's the normal time we do them. We just haven't hit that part of the year yet. And then we have two building initiatives, which we've talked a little bit about board at board presentations um, as we've moved through the fall. The first initiative is we are examining our math resource. So utilizing the Ed Reports protocol. Um, and we talked about this a little bit last year um, as we looked at middle school math and also a little bit when we looked at TC phonics the year before. Um, we began by asking districts in the region which programs they've been using, as well as looking at Ed Reports to examine which, um, which programs are highly rated in, uh, in their assessment. Um, we created an analysis tool based on teacher feedback of having used our previous curriculum, Eureka, to identify the priorities and the must-haves for a math curriculum. And using a um, Using those priorities, we examined the programs that we identified and we've narrowed it down right now to Eureka, the one we currently use, Bridges, Big Ideas and Envision. I mentioned that at our last um, board meeting. And um, just so you have an awareness, some of the criteria that we were looking at are how the materials align to New York standards, the type of instructional tasks and activities that are being assigned to students. So do they incorporate critical thinking, do they incorporate problem solving? Um, do we feel like they're developmentally appropriate and meet our student needs? Do they have equity, diversity, and access? So are there opportunities within the curriculum for both our advanced students as well as our tier one, two, and three students? Um, what kind of assessments are included? And um, is there opportunity for professional development or alignment with um, the middle school and high school math programs currently in use. So those are the criteria that we're, we're looking at. The next steps with that are the samples. Um, when I put this in, they were arriving, but they have now arrived in a beautiful rainbow array of books in district office. So those samples are here from the programs that we have narrowed it down to, the resources we narrowed it down to. Our teachers are going to be able to compare them and evaluate them based on those priorities that I just mentioned. And then our instructional team will have an opportunity to join a webinar, ask questions of the vendor if there's any questions that came up as we looked at the materials. And then using uh, that information, we would um, select the program we, bet we felt best met the district's needs and present it to the board. The second initiative is the revision of the elementary report card. Um, the reason we are trying to revise the, the report card is, is a few things. That revision actually started prior to my joining Haldane. Um, and it began with some work looking at the standards. The New York State standards have changed. We have the next gen standards versus the common core standards. So some of the standards are changed and we do have a standards-based report card. There was a parent survey that was done at the end of 2019. And what the parents uh, said during that, I know it's a few years back, but it's consistent with what I've been hearing as I've engaged with families around report card time, which is that right now it's just descriptors of the standards, you know, is your child mastering it um, or not. 
there's no room for comments or no place for comments from the teachers on the elementary report card and parents feel like that is a real um, missing piece. And then there's a lot of confusion on the rating descriptors. So right now, our academic standards are rated one, two, three, four, uh, four being that they are um, at or above grade level and then one being struggling. But then our learning behaviors and effort are graded one, two, three. And that causes a lot of confusion for families because they'll see a three on a learning behavior and think that their child is struggling um, when in fact that's the highest uh, that a child can receive in those. So that becomes very confusing for our families and um, we'd like to clear that up so that that's no longer getting in the way of what we're trying to communicate about kids. And then lastly, so when, when we got to um, my start and the strategic coherence plan was underway, that, that uh, work was identifying what are the teacher, student, um, and community priorities for our kids. And it was important as I met with our teachers and the instructional team to see if those qualities were reflected in the learning behaviors that we're reporting on in the in the on the report card and right now they aren't right now most of those learning behaviors there are some that reflect problem solving or critical thinking or communication but many of them are more classroom routines does your child complete homework do they um, complete their assignments that kind of a thing um, so as we revise the report card thinking about what parts of our healthy and essentials can we communicate to parents well um, and we may not be reporting on wellness as an example. That's something that uh, I don't think you would rate a child on. And we talked about that during the development of the strategic coherence plan, but certainly uh, problem solving, critical thinking and communication, if they're a value of the community and they've been identified through the strategic coherence plan, we should be giving parents information on those through our report card system. So, um, we're looking at those learning behaviors as well. So right now, our teachers are in the process at grade levels of looking at their ELA and math and science standards and making sure that the ones that are currently on the report card are aligned with the current standards or adjusting them as, uh, as appropriate. In January, we're going to have uh, articulation meetings where our kindergarten teachers take the standards that they identified um, and meet with our first grade teachers and make sure, do we have alignment between what we're saying are the priorities for each subject area for our students? And then vice versa, our fifth grade meeting down with our fourth grade, the third grade, et cetera, so that we have a chance to, um, a third grade teacher has a chance to meet with the fourth grade and the uh, second grade to make sure we have alignment and agreement on those standards. Then we'll meet on the learner behaviors, as I mentioned, to align with the healthy and essentials. Then we're going to need to decide what sorts of descriptors are we using to clear up that confusion for families and make sure that the descriptors we have for how a child is doing on the standards make sense to families and don't cause, um, don't cause misunderstandings. We would communicate what the new report card looked like and how it was going to be used to our families. And then for next year, we would have that new report card um, approved by the board and in use, and then imported into PowerSchool so that we can have it electronically. Now, um, I've met with PowerSchool, and it seems like having a new report card up and put into PowerSchool is a real possibility. At the very least, we would be able to use the new, new report card in a paper-based form like we currently do. Um, but ideally, we would get it into PowerSchool as soon as possible because it makes the data analysis and identification of trends a lot more um, user friendly and productive if we have that data in an electronic format that can be sorted, exported, and analyzed um, to get information on our students. Right now, if you wanted to see a trend across a grade level or um, with a group of students or for a child over time, you need to pull their paper report cards and look at them on paper rather than sorting data. So ideally um, getting it into PowerSchool as soon as possible um, would give us better 
analysis of our building and where our kids are at from another vantage point in, in addition to the, to the classroom data that we have from teachers to the NWEA, this would give us another way to look at it. So that is where the elementary school is at. Um, obviously we still have six more months of the year to go and a lot of work to be done, um, but that's where we're at right now. So any questions? I have a quick question. It, it's just a, a clarification to sure. remind me. Um, Ms. Pastula, the interventionist, we were able to, to um, maintain that position on a year-to-year -year basis because of the additional funding that we received through the federal government, correct? So yes, that's, that's not, that, correct. And that we, for the foreseeable future, that's right. And she works through K through five. Can you remind me too, um, you know, my son happened to have had Ms. Pastula and she was wonderful. Is she either, I can't remember, is she either a math or literary special, uh, literacy specialist? She is not. She's a certified K-5, uh, K-6 teacher, but, um, or actually 1-6. She's a 1-6 teacher. 1-6, um, With experience having been an interventionist in her previous school, but not certified in literacy. Great, thank you. Ms. Jammin, you mentioned yeah. um, you mentioned the reading issues with the kindergartners um, as probably uh, connected to their lack of pre-K, um, and and how the COVID um, epidemic has has affected the kindergartners. Right, they came in with some learning loss or um, not where they usually are. Right, they if they didn't attend, they didn't they didn't get a chance to. Um learn in a pre-K classroom the same way that they might have in previous years because a number of our families kept them home, yes. So are you seeing, you mentioned the other reading numbers are pretty much standard, you know, around 15% are reading below grade level. Um, are you seeing any other academic concerns from the, from the pandemic? Or are we at a different place um, at all in, in your opinion? So we have about the same number that we've had in previous years identified as tier two and tier three, which is a positive. Um, with those kindergartners, we have, we have seven, which is on par with the other grade levels that we've identified through um, classroom assessments as not closing that gap that seems to be from exposure. So those students are working um, more closely with uh, teachers and push in support right now. Um, so I anticipate like those would be the the seven that if you were to ask me to guess that I would anticipate would be tier two and three students um, as the year progresses or they move into first grade. Um, I mean, yes, the pandemic, it, it is in, it's impacted our students less so than I hear in other districts because we really did have most of our students in last year, but um, it, it's had it's had impacts our, our students are. Uh, especially second and third grade, the, the types of things we're seeing is a little bit different. So um, Ms. Gernant, one of our special education teachers has been doing a lot of work uh, and running some after school staff development around phonemic awareness, because if you think about it, our second graders were here, but impacted by COVID last year, and then missed a chunk of kindergarten where they were getting phonics instruction would have been getting phonics instruction and really solidifying those reading skills in kindergarten um so they're they're missing there there's some gaps in their how they tie sounds to letters and how they tie letters back to sounds um and then third grade same thing they missed part of first grade um second grade was different you know we had less opportunities for pulling small groups um, because we were really trying to keep strict distancing so there was more one-on-one -on -one or just different ways of running small groups um, and so there are some gaps in in phonics that we are seeing um, and it's been really interesting to sit in on those um, those workshops with Ms. Gernant and our, a lot of our third, fourth, and fifth grade teachers have been going to them or talking to her about it to 
to fill those gaps for the older students where we don't usually have phonics instruction grade three and up. So uh, it's a gap I think we'll be seeing and thinking about looking. It ties a lot into the work Ms. Rounds and Mr. Grenant have been talking about this year with literacy and how we support our, our students who are struggling with it. And would you say that phonics and literacy are, is the mm -hmm. area that it's most obvious to you or is it also in math and in other areas as well? Or does the literacy piece, is that what stands out? The literacy piece has really been standing out. I mean, I know a lot of the data shows that uh, the math and fluency was impacted as well. Um, it's hard sometimes to pull out what's literacy and what's math when the problems are word problems. So I think they they just they go they go together. Gotcha. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Gemin, one other uh, on that we're we're currently using units of study as our primary curriculum, yeah. correct? And I know that there was some uh, reconsideration because of some. Uh, you know, uh, some reviews of that curriculum um, recently that said that it might not be the most effective. And I, and I was curious to know, is that a, a is that assessment of the efficacy of that program happening at the school level? Or is it, uh, you know, is that something I know that Dr. Benante was reviewing the research on that as well. And I'm just curious to know. Um, yeah, so we adopted TC reading, writing and phonics as our resource, but we don't use them exclusively and we don't follow them verbatim, our teachers do have the ability to create interdisciplinary um, projects to use other resources to fill gaps within a program. Um, so like one of the resources that Ms. Grenant was presenting was a, you know, additional strategies for how to help students with tricky words. So we supplement and use other resources in addition versus, um, I do know some districts say, you know, you're going to do this day one and we should all be doing the same. We don't use it that strictly. We use it as a resource and then supplement it and um, use, you know, there's there's some writing pieces of the TC phonics, um, physical writing, like how to form letters that are not as strong as um, some of the teachers would like or don't have some of the supports that students might need. And so they'll use the foundations chart and pull it out and help kids practice how to make their letters, how to start um, and how to do that. And that's fine. If, if there's an intervention or support that a child needs, then we, we use other resources to supplement as well. Thank you. Um, I'm just noticing, I don't, is, um, is Catherine checking out our, our attendees and I see like a raised hand. We're going to address those during the public comment section, right? Okay. Any more questions for Ms. Jammin? Okay, I think, thank you very much. All right, thank you. I'll see you again in a second. <laughs> Great, we'll be here. Um, so yeah, so we're gonna go into public comment. Um, communication from the public. So this first public comment section is for people who would like to make comments on the special presentation that we just heard or on any upcoming agenda items. Um, so I will just turn it over to Ms. Platt to see if there's Somebody that has chatted. And Catherine, let me help you because I, I think the meeting's under me. So I don't know if you're able to actually promote anyone to pan, right? So Jen, if uh, it's okay with you, I'm assuming uh, we would follow the rules that we followed when we were doing these more often, which is if anybody would like to make a comment, uh, they're welcome to raise, use the raise your hand feature uh, in Zoom. Uh, and then I will promote you to a panelist. So you'll have uh, the benefit of joining us here on screen, making whatever comment you wish to make, uh, following the rules or guidelines that Jen provided. And then we will, uh, or I will, put you back into the, uh, as an attendee. So Ms. Cotter, your hand is raised. So you have the 
uh, pleasure here, I guess, of going first. I'm gonna promote you to panelists, assuming uh, you have a question or comment you'd like to make, and this just takes a moment to occur. All right, Ms. Cotter, I see you now on the screen. If you just want to unmute yourself and, oh, and you're there, great. <laughs> so. Okay, this is how this works, great. Right, Megan, go ahead. <laughs> um, Christine, you did a good job on your presentation, so uh, you know, kudos to that. Um, but going through it, I just have a question. I have a few questions. Um, I heard a lot of like emotional goals that are great for the children, but what are some of your educational goals like specifically for the children? Um, and then you can piggyback that with your chart for the children in the reading that you did that blue and red chart. So what are some of the specific goals, educational goals that you have for the elementary school? So I just wanna make sure I, I step in here. Um, so Ms. Jam, so these public comments are just comments, so it's not really question and answer. Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't really know how the question and answer thing aspect works here on Zoom. So yeah. can we just ask the question and like we'll hear the answer later or how okay. does that work? <laughs> Put it into the atmosphere um, and then the uh, the principal or the board president or the superintendent, like whomever is appropriate to answer your question, we'll get back oh. to you with your answering your question. So you're like, this is just like your comment. Like personally or? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So then I have like three questions you can put in a bullet point in an email then. Okay. Is that how this works? Yeah. So continue with your comments. Oh, so okay. Like a comment section, not so much like a dialogue section. Oh, so it's not like a forum. Okay. Yeah, it's not like what? a forum to chat. It's just you okay. comment, mention. Okay, comment, that's fine. We'll get back to you. Okay. Um, so that was my first comment or question. Um, and my second one is I'm just regarding the teachers. My like, what are we planning as a whole as um, Halding and as one to put in place for these teachers during the learning experience during COVID? Like what is in place? What are we doing moving forward for them? And how are our children once again going to benefit from their development um, with COVID and with the development of our elementary, then going into junior high and then eventually going to high school. Like what is the flow that we are projecting or that we are seeing? So I, I'm getting a lot of stares on the Zoom. I don't really know. No, that, that, so your, those questions have been recorded. We've noticed okay. Christine, Ms. Jammin heard them, Dr. Benante heard them, I heard them. And then if you have any other comments or questions that you wanna have everybody here, now is the time you have the floor. Yeah, no, those were just some like specific questions that I had on an elementary school level. And then obviously my children are gonna be moving through the school district event, obviously eventually, but right now I'm really just concerned about the specific goals, the educational goals that the elementary school has, and then what we're doing for our teachers during the COVID, COVID times, so to speak. So if you can just get back to me on that, that would be great. Thank you so much. Thanks for, yeah. Thanks for being here. <laughs> okay, do we have any other hands, comments? Okay, so I think we're good in the comments. There's another section at the end of the meeting where, um, you can, anybody else can comment on um, what we've heard or on just kind of anything. It's kind of a more general uh, comment period. So you'll have another chance if anyone wants to say anything else. And we're gonna go into the information reports. So um, I'll turn it over to Luke to start us off. All right, thank you. Uh, so what I got a few things. Uh, we have the second issue of the How They Newspaper, the Blueprint. It's being released uh, via on the website, Highland website, as well as featured by the Highlands Current. Uh, and this uh, issue includes coverage of clubs, book reviews, and as well as mental health tips. Uh, one of these things is the Blue Devils is being high, uh, the Blues Devils being highlighted, who performed along with the jazz band, the Blue Notes, and the middle and high school band and choruses. They performed in their 
uh, recorded concert, which will be uh, the link for that will be posted and will be sent out soon, which was all there. And then finally, we just have the holiday spirit week uh, in high school. It's ongoing it has things like holiday pajama day and ugly sweater day. So it's been fun going in right before break. So. But, yeah. Great. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Jammin, just in case we wanted to have you have more stuff to tell us. Just in case you haven't seen me enough. No, um, my board report, knowing that my um, detail report was this evening, I left my board report to focus on some of the um, more community highlights. Uh, so at the beginning of the month, we had our parents back in the building for parent teacher conferences. It seems like a year ago, but it was only a couple of weeks ago. And it was truly wonderful to have parents back in the building. Um, it was a small scale, you know, one on one with teachers, but they were back, they were able to see their child's classroom. Some of our parents for the first time since the last time parents were in the building on a, on a larger scale was December of 2019. Um, so some of our families with kindergarten and first graders hadn't seen their their child's classroom um, in person other than on zoom so it was great to have them in the building show them around see their classroom sit with their teachers face to face and hear about their kids. Um, our student council was elected in November and their first initiative of the year was that they met um, they discussed with the Phillipstown Food Pantry what kind of needs they had and identified that food after the holidays is a real need and that they started collecting food now that can be given to the food pantry following the holiday. So we have a food drive that's running through uh, Jan the end of the first week back. So January 7th, um, they're collecting and setting that up with our kids. And they've also been collecting notes for local nursing homes. So it's just been great to see them um, care so much about their community and put those uh, initiatives in place. So uh, unfortunately, COVID does what it does. And um, our uh, marionette performance tomorrow is canceled because one of the performers has symptoms and needs to get tested and I'm not exposing everyone's children to a possible COVID case. So that is postponed, um, but we will still be having our fourth, fifth grade chorus perform at dismissal on Thursday. So that is still some excitement. And I know our teachers are making the week um, academically focused and uh, also fun as we approach the winter break. Great, thank you. Dr. Steelke. Good evening, everyone. I second Ms. Jammin. It was definitely a pleasure to have parents in the building for parent teacher conferences. Um, three other highlights that are occurring this season at the middle school. Um, the the uh, Community Read Planning Committee selected Refugee by Alan Gratz for our community read. Um, and our tentative date is April 21st. We pushed it a little bit later in the year so that the tents would be back up. Um, hopefully that will um, become a confirmed date and you'll see it on the district calendar and advertisements will go out um, for the community read. Uh, also, so big big thank you to Jeff Silverstein, the, our, our VP um, of the PTA to the middle school who put together a robust um, community read planning committee and is also working with um, Hudson Valley Shakespeare Festival to collaborate uh, as we've done in the past with the sixth grade. Um, this year's performance is the Midsummer's Night Dream and um, early the we're in the early stages of planning a collaboration um, with the sixth grade for that. So that's really exciting and more to follow on that. And we're anxiously awaiting the video release of our winter concerts, which were filmed the uh, first week of December. So very excited about that as well. Happy holidays, everyone. Thank you. Ms. Sniffen. Off the press, we just got the video release for the holiday production. It's in your inbox. So hopefully that'll come out tomorrow. Uh, midday, it'll be blasted out and posted on the website. But I did get a sneak peek of uh, a couple of the performances and it's amazing. Uh, I have to say who we got to do the videography and the sound, it's really of high quality. So thank you to the Haldane School Foundation and the Haldane Arts Alliance for their support of that. But that's not what I was gonna talk about. 
Um, so I just, in the, in the spirit of giving uh, during the holiday season, um, I'd like to just highlight some volunteerism and some work that's been going on in the high school building. Um, first, I know Dr. Benante had mentioned the drama production at the last meeting, and he had um, thanked Martha and uh, Andre McHugh for their work and commitment to the fine arts. But I also want to just mention some of the volunteers who really behind the scenes help in making that production possible. So um, Mr. McDonald, Ms. Chandler, Ms. Bocour, um, Ms. Faraday, Mr. Mekalakis, Mr. Sniffen, Mr. Koch, and Mrs. Sandlin. Um, without their volunteerism, uh, the production and all that goes into it would not be possible. So we thank them. Um, last, no, I'm sorry, it's two Thursdays ago now, December 9th, we welcomed all the Manitou and Garrison eighth grade students to Haldane High School um, for a tour and a visit and kind of getting the feel of the campus. Um, and we had different students volunteer their time to lead the tours and run panel discussion and share some of their experiences at Haldane. So I'd like to thank Caroline Nelson, Conrad White, Matt McCoy, Josephine Jarmouche, Matteo Cervone, Sophia Skanga, and Maya Gelber um, for their participation in that, in that morning. Um, also today, um, Dr. Silky, myself, Ms. Jammin, uh, and Dawn Rosano had a chance to help and organize the Giving Tree, which this year, I think a record, 33 students um, we were able to, to support. And that's thanks to the PTA, to Tara Rounds, uh, Renee Curry, Nicole Rivera, Don Rosano, Scott Manny, um, for their commitment in, in making that an annual tradition uh, here at Haldane. And my last volunteer one uh, for the night is we finally got our state approval um, to run the EMT course alongside Dutchess Community College in the Phillipstown Ambulance Park. So those students and adults 16 and over who expressed interest in taking the course approximately six to eight weeks ago when the survey went out, you'll be receiving information um, from Nick Falcone of the Phillipstown Ambulance Corps. And I think just last week, I was reading an article in Low HUD about the true need in our region in Putnam, Westchester and Rockland counties um, that are really struggling with ENTs on the road to, to support um, people in need. So I encourage anybody who hasn't signed up for that, that there still probably is time and they can still squeeze you in. Uh, to date, to be aware of, the junior college planning meeting is January 6th, and we will be holding an in-person National Honor Society induction ceremony on January 13th. So that's it. That's a lot. Thank you. So lot. <laughs> Ms. Rounds. Hi, good evening. Uh, so just a couple of updates to share for this month. Uh, the first Learning Differences Committee meeting did take place at the end of November, um, and it included a small group of parents and teachers from each building. Um, so the discussion for this first meeting surrounded alignment of services at each level in the special education department, as well as communication between parents and teachers, um, how we share information, and uh, the group had a good brainstorming session together. Um, I think it was a positive and productive initial meeting. So I'd like to thank Teresa Lagerman, who is the uh, chairperson for this committee, and to uh, thank you to all the parents and um, teachers who attended that first meeting. I look forward to future meetings of the Learning Differences Committee. Um, also, at the, early, at the early part of this month, uh, we had our DBT consultant who works very closely with our clinical staff um, Nora, Dr. Nora Girardi uh, provided an online training. Our clinical staff arranged for this training uh, for teachers that could sign up to uh, learn skills for being an emotional coach. Uh, we had 20 staff members attend, so it was well attended. Um, and the training surrounded um, a short term in the moment uh, type of intervention. Um, so that we uh, could work with students who may become emotionally dysregulated during the day before they can um, meet with a counselor. So uh, some of the training was in uh, a lot of validation and DBT, we always say validate, validate, validate first, um, you know, before we're, we're looking to fix problems and uh, redirect the student to a skill that they can use um, to, to regulate themselves, such as self-soothing or distraction. Uh, praising the student for success in this and reinforcing new learning. 
Um, so I think the training was uh, well received and well attended. Um, they look forward to future trainings that can be provided. Um, so thank you to our clinical staff for arranging for that. Great, thank you. Mr. Elder. Good evening, everybody. Um, just want to give a, a little update on the human resources side. Um, uh, as I said in my report that this year, uh, I'm proud to represent Haldane at the uh, Lower Hudson Council, Council School Personnel Association um, Diversity Job Fair, which is going to be held on uh, virtual um, job fair, which is held on February 22nd on Saturday. And um, this was created a couple of years ago. Um, and this year it has 44 different districts are participating um, throughout the region. Um, and it's really an opportunity for school districts to meet with prospective candidates that are looking for employment opportunities. Um, but what I really said, like in my report, it, it's really an opportunity that allows us uh, to go out and kind of communicate the mission and values of Haldane and, and speak to people um, about what the great work that we're doing up here. And um, provides an opportunity for us to kind of meet candidates for potential vacancies we may have or um, vacancies we don't even know about. Um, but it's always good to have a healthy pool of individuals um, that when vacancies do arise that we were able to call upon. And um, since I read that report, uh, Ms. Sniffen had uh, forwarded me something. I'll also be representing um, Haldane in March uh, up at the SUNY New Paltz Job Fair, which is going to have up to 30 districts uh, doing something very, very similar. Um, and so it's all part of the uh, process of uh, and the role of human resources of just trying to get out there and, and communicate our mission and values to as many people as we can. And uh, just keep keep interviewing and keep talking with people. And, and uh, it's a great way of building um, a, a resource to have some really high quality candidates should the time arise. Great. Thank you so much. Mr. Cowan. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'd like to start by just picking up where I left off last month and, and finish recognizing the last of our fall sports teams and uh, some of the uh, awards and honors their players had achieved. Our football team um, won their league championship this year, and I believe it was the first time in 20 years since they had done so. They were section one finalists and regional finalists. Um, players earning all league honors are Thomas Tucker, Giancarlo, uh, Giancarlo Carone, Ryan Irwin, Ryan Van Tassel, Soleil Gaines, Evan Jacinta, Dylan Rucker, Jake Mason, Jack Hartman, and Will Etta. Um, players earning all conference honors, Ryan Irwin and Evan Jacinta. Um, our players earning all section honors, John Carlo Carone, and John Carlo was also the defensive back of the year uh, for League Two. And I'd like to say congratulations to Coach Ryan McConville, who earned Coach of the Year um, for League Two. Um, and to close out our fall season, I just want to make mention that all of our fall varsity teams this year earned uh, scholar athlete team recognition uh, from the New York State Public High School Athletic Association. And to um, just review that again, uh, in order to receive that honor, the team's average GPA for 75% of the roster must be greater than or equal to 90. Um, so that's an outstanding job by our fall uh, student athletes and, and hats off to our teachers and support staff that work with our students daily. And then I'd like to just close by um, sharing with the board that I intend on starting a, um, a group uh, for student athletes that will be referred to as the Student Athlete Council. Um, this will be um, uh, a group of students with representatives from each of our varsity teams who will meet with me monthly. And um, we will discuss things like character, uh, leadership, captain training, mentorship of modified athletes. Um, we'll look to um, have discussions around uh, sportsmanship and, and other um, uh, topics within ath athletics. And uh, we'll work towards planning and facilitating the community service project annually. Um, so my goal for the new year will be to start to meet with these students monthly to really kind of create a format of what will follow um, the following school year. So I'm excited to get working with this group, and um, I think it'll be uh, great for our student athletes. And one last update, our boys varsity basketball team beat Peekskill tonight, 73 to 59. Happy holidays, everyone. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Walsh. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, facilities department has been busy this month just maintaining our day-to-day -day operations. 
Um, well, we've been busy and we've been steady. We're looking forward to the reprieve, uh, the winter break, uh, the upcoming winter break. Um, we have some work planned that can only be completed while kids are not in, in the buildings. Uh, we broke our, our group down into teams. We have a painting team to do some miscellaneous painting throughout the district. We'll be conducting some HVAC repairs, both in-house and contracted. We'll be doing some deep cleaning of classrooms and re-burnishing of floors to get the classrooms and floors back to the, the condition that they were when kids came into the building in September. We also have some contracted work taking place over the break. We'll be cleaning the ductwork within the elementary school building. We'll also be replacing the wall padding within the small gymnasium. So at the next board meeting, hopefully we see a nice refreshed wall padding uh, within that space. Um, earlier in the month, uh, in December, December 9th, we open up bids for a small site work uh, project, which is the redirection of some stormwater uh, flow within the flagpole and the circle area there. That was uh, the apparent low bidder is contact construction technology. Uh, additionally, uh, in, in terms of our capital construction work, Ron Lombardo Plumbing and Heating of, of Rockland County was awarded the, the phase two, the electrical mechanical upgrades. Contracts were signed for that work. Kickoff meeting was conducted. We're working with the contractor and the architect now in the approval of submittals, as well as coordinating a construction schedule in terms of lead time of equipment as, um, as it coordinates with uh, the school calendar. So we'll be hopefully be able to complete some of that work uh, throughout the year when it's not impactful to the district and into summer 2022. And that's all that I have unless there are any questions. Sounds good, thank you. I have a question for Tim, I'm sorry. Um, I couldn't unmute myself fast enough here. Um, I was just wondering about that, about the, the flagpole site improvement. Is that related to when we did the walkthrough with the board in September, is that related to the water that comes in through the building? That is not related. Currently, um, the water that comes into the building, which is down into the music room and, and labeled River Haldane, which sometimes flows into the hallway, that is um, in the hands of the district architect. They'll be looking at that. That includes some potentially minor site work, but also building waterproofing to prevent water from coming in. This is water that is strictly uh, at the flagpole which in times of torrential rains uh, floods that area severely and um, is, is impactful to access to the building. It impacts a underground fuel oil storage tank, which is just off of, of that area. So it's something that we're just remediating uh, within that flagpole area. Okay, and I was just wondering why now, but you sort of you sort of answered that a little bit, but does it create like a safety hazard when the kids, when people walk? It, it does. So it has flooded um, in my two year tenure, um, I'll call it many times. So it impacts access to the building. Um, had, we don't want it to undermine any infrastructure or concrete that is there at the flagpole um, and prevents access to the building when it is uh, flooded. Okay. And this is the money from that comes from your, your budget for the capital, uh, for the current budget that was approved last year, right? So that's not, it was already. Um, it's from our operating budget, not operating from the budget. capital construction project. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, going into consent agenda minutes, may I have a motion please? So moved. Second. These are our minutes from the December, December 7th meeting. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, uh, consent, oh, committee minutes are here. These are the wellness committee minutes from November 15th, the code of conduct committee minutes from December 6th. And then we go into consent agenda financial. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, consent agenda personnel, may I have a motion please? So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? The um, supplemental memorandum of agreement, I believe was discussed um, at our last meeting. Um, okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? So we're going into the CSE CPSE recommendations. I'll turn it to Ms. Platt. Be it resolved that upon the recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools, the Board of Education hereby approves the recommendations 
of the Committees on Special Education and Preschool Special Education as presented. Can I have a motion, please? So move, but actually I'm just noticing there's no, I don't have any, I don't have any, I just realized there's no attachment. Oh, in really? Board for me. There is for you. Mm -hmm. Okay. But why don't we, um, Peggy, are you, you in the public view by chance? And we will discuss. I didn't, I, I thought I logged in. Nope, I'm in mine. But maybe, maybe that's it. Maybe that's it. I don't have them either, but an attachment either. Yeah, no, because I have executive content for other items. I don't have it for this. It's in the public content. So I don't have anything, I don't have an attachment under public content or executive content for CSE, CPSC. If other people have it and it's actually there, that's fine. My concern was if there wasn't an attachment, then our passing this would have an, would, would, would influence the decision. I'm okay not seeing it in this minute. Are you talking about the CPSC recommendations that we already approved? Because we've moved on to the field trip guidelines. That's what we're talking about now. Okay, I must have had a brain freeze because I didn't. I thought I would just made a motion. I, I didn't. Okay. So we did number one, the CSC CPSC recommendations. Now we're on to number two, the field I, trip guidelines. And apparently there are no, it, it's okay that there's not an attachment. If that's the case, then we don't need to talk about this anymore. Yeah. For the CSE CPSC recommendations, there's not always an attachment because it's generally private information. But no, there, there's always there's typically there's always an attachment right. that includes the yeah. the the, the non-identifiable numbers. But right. that's if everything's okay and Catherine doesn't see a problem with that, with there not being attachment, then I don't think it's an issue. Okay, okay. Um okay. So Jen, I, Jen, we don't have a vote on that though. So we, we don't have a vote on the CSE. That's why I brought it up, Jen. Oh, then did I have a brain freeze? Yeah, I think Wait, so. I was like, I was afraid I just had like a moment of dementia. No, we hadn't voted. We had we had we had uh passed a motion to discuss it, which is why I brought up that there's not an attachment. Okay. Well, then I'm glad you're bringing it up. Um, I, I agree with you. I don't see an attachment either. Sarah, um, do you recall um, if this were item were to carry forward to the January uh, agenda, does it get in the way of any services for students uh, right now? Uh, I think the one service that um, I'm thinking of uh, we can put in place uh, informally on a trial basis. So Jen, uh, given that it doesn't appear the attachment is there and we want to honor the board's uh, ability to review everything before they vote, I appreciate the board's, I think what would be support uh, in not wanting to interfere with services, but we do have only, uh, I think two school days prior to a break. And then we have a board meeting, you know, a day or two later uh, after the break. So I would actually move that we table this uh, item until and include it on the agenda on the fourth. That way there, it doesn't present any obstacles for the board's processes. Yeah, and I apologize for not noting this before. That's fine. This uh, I must've missed it as well as I prepped the agenda. Um, okay, great. Well, I apologize for not even talking about the right number, Peggy, so. <laughs> Okay. I was perfectly um, willing to accept that I had everybody. Table number one. We're moving on to number two. Um, class field trip guidelines. And I'm turning over it to Ms. Platt. Be it resolved that upon the recommendation of the superintendent of schools, the Board of Education hereby accepts the recommendation for field trips and the guidelines set forth herein for the 2021-2022 school year. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Jen, if I may, I just wanted to thank uh, Julia, Marianne, and uh, Christine for working on this. They really 
uh, sat and considered the various field trips that our students take uh, both during the day and overnight over the course of the school year. And setting these guidelines is our, an attempt on our part to, again, try to continue to reestablish components of our program that were in place prior to the pandemic uh, once again. Uh, we very well may encounter some, some issues on taking some of these trips this year. We're, we're prepared for that if that's the case, obviously, uh, given the circumstances. But we want to make every effort uh, to allow our students to participate in these experiences. Uh, many of them become foundational uh, components of a child's experience at a particular grade level or at various points in their experience at Haldane. Um, so uh, with these guidelines in place, uh, we feel uh, that our kids can participate safely. Yeah, I really appreciated reading the student council letters um, as well. Okay, um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ready? Campus Master Planning Committee charge. Um, are we voting on this or are we just- Nope, so it's, it's on for discussion only. Yeah. And I, I just wanted to uh, draw the board's attention to the overview of the ad hoc committee. So uh, last meeting, we discussed the process for engaging uh, a consultant uh, through the RFP process to facilitate uh, components of the uh, campus master plan. I alluded to having a group of community members, both internal and external, who would be a part of this work. Uh, and this is the draft of the ad hoc uh, committee. Um, uh, I would like the board uh, to just spend some time reviewing this uh, over the course of the next couple of weeks. And I can really use your feedback on what, uh, in particular, what external community groups you would like to see the administration engage in having uh, them uh, as participants or representative from said groups as participants in the process. So you'll, you'll see in that draft, I didn't list any external groups. I, I listed only internal uh, folks. Uh, I'm really looking to the board to help uh, define which external community groups you um, think should be engaged as part of this work. So I have, I have a question about that in terms of the kind of feedback you're looking from looking for from us. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple of different ways, I guess, that this could go. So when you're talking about external groups, like groups completely external to the school district. So Chamber of Commerce. Exactly. Okay. And not necessarily our affiliated parent groups to identify the parent representatives, but really folks from the community. So I, yeah, okay. I guess you said that perfectly clearly, but I, I needed okay. to confirm it. Um, okay, great. All right. Yeah, and, and the intention was not to, you know, use this meeting to name them all. And, the, you know, I, I figured- I'm not going to you know, try our, to. <laughs> I, I know you won't. <laughs> that our board would want to just deliberate on that. And if you could be prepared to share uh, that information with me uh, at our next meeting, that would be helpful because <laughs> we want to stay on timeline here. And then the administration will begin the process for engaging uh, these uh, groups or individuals in becoming a part of uh, the ad hoc committee. And as I mentioned at our last meeting, these, uh, whoever would be, uh, we reach out to, they will be presented to the board um, uh, to endorse. Uh, so they, they will come with, uh, I will position this for board approval uh, to be a member of this group. I think that's an important. Mm -hmm. And is there a plan yet or thoughts about a plan for how we'd identify the parent representatives? Yeah, uh, so I, I'd like to uh, bring that information to you at our next meeting. Sure. Um, I do have some, some thoughts regarding how we would facilitate that uh, that I'd like to share with the board um, as we start to bring the ad hoc committee structure to closure, which I would anticipate at our next meeting. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, going into our final communication from the public. So this is an opportunity to share comments with us about anything that we have talked about at the meeting or anything, anything else district related. I do not see any hands raised. Well, I'm going to assume no one wants to talk to us. 
and um, we'll go into board committee reports. So policy committee update. I'll turn that over to Peggy. So we have a lot to report. <laughs> well, we do. Um, so the, you know, we've talked a while about our process and establishing the cycle of meetings and review. And so Phil, Jen, and I, along with, um, it was supported by Megan Shields, met uh, for uh, right before this meeting. We did a few different things. So one of the things we did was we began our, our systematic review of the of all the, the policies in the manual. So that's pretty straightforward. And then we also did um, some additional review of policies that have come to our attention through Erie One BOCES as policies that they are recommending um, that we either update or adopt. And so we've reviewed those and our plan for how to conduct this process, right? We're talking about you know, hundreds of policy, hundreds of pages, is that um, even though the policy manual will be updated, audited and updated by Erie One BOCES just once a year, we're going to engage in a cycle of reading and review of the processes as the committee reviews them and decides to bring them forward to the board, right? So remember this last time we had this whole brand new policy manual. It was not feasible for anyone to review all of them. Um, but even at this point, um, as new policies come, uh, we want to engage the board in the opportunity and the public in identifying which policies we're about to consider um, or we are considering either adopting or revising. And so look for on your January 4th agenda, uh, a handful of policies that are going to be ready for their first read. Um, and so one related to smoking, some, you know, and we can go through what the different uh, what the different policies are then. Um, and I think that's, I think that's it. Yeah. I guess the other thing we could do, I, I think this makes sense. I had, we hadn't talked about this, but the policies that we reviewed today as part of our cyclical process were, oh gosh, I don't actually have the numbers up anymore because I closed my agenda. It's basically the first 25 pages of the I, I actually well, maybe I'll wait until our next meeting and I'll just let you know I'll just read out the list of the policies that review we reviewed but if you look at the beginning of the policy manual the first policies really are very much sort of about the board and 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 um as well as sort of positions that we appoint every year for example at the at the annual meeting so if you want to get a sense of you know the 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 progress we're doing that's 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 what we're doing and uh i guess actually jen any changes that we're suggesting to those policies also need to be brought before the board as well even if they're minor like little so i think we'll just want to check in about that with megan because i think we talked about some of those changes but i don't think we necessarily put those policies that were in those first 20 on the list of what we want to bring before the board on January 4th, even though those changes are actually really quite minor, they still need to come before the board. So we just need to do that. Phil, if you could follow up with Megan Shields about that. Thank you. Any questions? Mm, scintillating stuff, but it's good. It's actually nice. It was actually nice to have this meeting, you know, hour and a half meeting where we're really making the kind of progress that we've been aiming towards accomplishing for the past couple of years, working towards. Working towards. Yeah, no, it was good. Um, okay, good. So, oh, and just to note, the first reading is really just like the the first reading. It, we won't approve it at the first meeting. We, there's a second reading where there's an, an approval option, um, which won't happen till towards you know the the second meeting in January. So you'll get the policies to read and like be prepared to like give comments or ask questions but the approval process doesn't happen until the second reading. Thanks for clarifying that, Jen. Um, okay, so the Westchester Putnam School Boards Association, I will give just a shout out to two things that they, um, you guys all get those chalkboard emails. In their recent one, they um, 
they really called out the this um, publication called Edutopia, and it they listed like the top ten articles from um, education articles from the year, in their opinion. And I felt like it was so interesting because the first one um, really related to a conversation we were having as a board between the difference between like promoting social emotional learning, but promoting academic learning and how can we do both. And um, and then I realized you can sign up for Edutopia, um, you know, emails, then they'll just send them to your email. So if like you have an interest in continuing to get it's like a little newsletter, um, it's really kind of cool and helpful. I feel like they do a good job. So I'm just throwing that out there to you guys. And you've also gotten some publication about the upcoming Area 10 director um, election for NISBA. And Westchester Putt has sent that information out as well, just to give everybody the information. There's three people running for um, the Area 10 directorship, which is our directorship, which governs us um, and represents us with NISBA. So um, we'll be voting on that next month. Um, and there's, there's three different candidates that you can all review, but we will have to, um, as a board, you know, submit our um, collective vote for one of them. Um, so. Can I ask a follow-up question? So I know we got the one email that had all three, I know we received one email that had three resumes, but then I feel like there was a, another email that Catherine forwarded and I, was that, had, I should have, I, I'm embarrassed that I haven't, I, I assumed that was a fourth additional person, but that person was in the original email. It was this, no, it was one of the, the three. It was, okay. It was was. wasn't included in the first email or she just wanted to add something, but it's, it's one of the three. It was one of the three. Okay, I hadn't I hadn't read them closely yet, and I had assumed it was a fourth person, but it's just those three folks that were in that initial email. Great. Okay. Thank you. So we can talk about those people at our next. Um, that's it. Okay, board reflections. Does anybody have anything they would like to share? I have sort of a. A, a lot, you know, a question I like to throw out into the ether um, that I'm obviously not going to get a huge answer on, but you know, <clears throat> it's sort of weird out there right now in the world with this, <clears throat> with this COVID kind of swirling around, and I'm just wondering how everyone is doing in terms of staff and 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 teachers and students. I mean, I think I'm always so focused on my kid and what's going on in the classroom, um, but you know, also with the staff and the teachers, it just it would it, it'd be nice to know how they're feeling because I don't get a lot of feedback. I don't know if it's because I'm not talking to them on the blacktop, but um, I don't know. It's worrisome out there just in general, the bigger picture. So, you know, I, it'd be nice to hear a little bit more feedback on how, on how folks inside the building are doing, the folks that are interacting with our kids every day. So anyway, just wanted to throw that out there. Like a general climate. An, an, yeah. A temperature check. Temperature check, how are plans in place? You know, are we gonna shut down again? I hope not, um, but if, if we do shut down, is there a plan in place? You know, and, and we've heard about this, we hear about this a lot, but um, <clears throat> things change so quickly, you know, and it, we, it felt a little bit more resilient a few weeks ago, uh, if, you're, if you're talking about COVID specifically, and um, it's coming back now. So I don't know, you know, just sort of a reiteration, maybe when we come back on, on where we are and that type of thing and, and what we can expect as far as what we can expect, if that makes sense. You know, nothing's for sure, but it's, it's so uncertain right now, so. Um, yeah. Dr. Benante, do you have any final thoughts to share? Uh, a few. Um, sorry, my kids are coming home, so it's a little loud. There. <laughs> sorry if I appear distracted. And I, I, I just am, I'm thinking about what Maggie shared, and I, I think I was more candid last year on some of the staff matters than I have been this year. Um, and there's this tendency just to, you know, this year is different, but it's really not different. But um, I have no issue sharing that I believe our staff encounters a high level of stress uh, and is uh, each day. Um, and that's exacerbated as we see um, significant shifts in 
uh, the public health matters that are impacting us. So like, as you see the rise of variants and whatnot, it puts more stress on our school system and it puts more stress on our staff, um, uh, both our teaching staff and our administrative staff, our clerical staff. Um, so um, as far as the vibe, I, uh, while I you know, would hope that it's a, uh, this time of year can be, you know, would be a joyous time, celebratory time, um, my perception is that it is not. Um, it doesn't carry that level of excitement uh, that it may have pre-COVID and that these times uh, of when we get before a break, it comes with a, um, really just a, a sense of, uh, uh, I need to get to the break um, and because I need that time uh, for myself or for my family. Uh, Jen and I were talking on, um, it's funny, Jen, you, you shared something with me as it related to school start time, but I think it applies to a lot more than just school start time. Uh, because we know like the, and not to draw a direct equation between the two, but we know that there's this, certainly this perceived benefit. And I think some, uh, a base of research exists on, on the benefits, the potential benefits of starting school later. But as, as Jen had shared, and I, we were talking one time, you know, unless that's followed by a lot of other things, you know, uh, that also incorporate changes that, you know, really would need to be made in the home, uh, the benefit can be negligible. Um, and I think I struggle with this sometimes as our administrative team was talking about this today, because we recognize the, the high level of stress and uh, our staff encounters and uh, burnout and frustration. And there's a lot coming out now about teacher mental health and, uh, um, and it, it demands our attention. And I'm glad, again, Maggie, you brought it up. And, you know, there's these things, uh, but I don't, I don't know what, often these articles are not followed by like what strategies we could employ or what we could be doing to make that better. And I, I really do worry um, for our staff, uh, yeah, for, for the staff that's on this call right now, because I, I or on the Zoom, because I know they encounter a lot of this as well, uh, that we're pointing to the problem, but there isn't a lot of solutions being presented to follow that can guide district leaders or building leaders or people who influence policy like our boards uh, on steps that we could be taking to um, better, you know, to, to help improve these conditions that now exist within our, with our building. Um, and they're also like, God, I don't venture on the Twitter anymore. I used to go there, you know, I get some good ideas about leadership and the idea, but it's like now inundated with a high level. Of, it just makes me more stressed. And I think it makes our staff more stressed too. So even some of these, you know, these outlets you could grab onto that were at one point really positive and uplifting, <laughs> at least my Twitter feed was um, carefully cultivated Twitter feed, um, you know, just aren't that way anymore. They keep pointing to the issue, the issue, the issue. And um, there, we're short on solutions right now. So um, yeah, I know my team's sitting with this, but I, I did want to acknowledge because I think uh, Tara shared, you know, validate, validate, validate. I think part of this is validating, you know, how people feel. And, um, you know, we acknowledge that uh, people are, it's a very stressful time uh, to work in schools and um, for all employees, uh, not just our teaching staff. And, um, uh, but I'm glad you brought that up, uh, Maggie. Uh, to transition to a uh, um, perhaps a lighter element before I close. Luke, you had mentioned the ugly sweater contest, and I just wanted to clarify, do you have an ugly sweater that you'll be wearing? Will you be participating in the ugly sweater uh, day? I'm sorry, it, it may not be a contest. Well, yeah, there actually is a, a photo contest, I think by the end of the week for best photo, but Got it. I do have a sweater. I don't know if you consider it ugly, maybe by some standards, but I'm definitely going to be wearing a sweater. I'm trying to get sure. in the spirit. Got yeah. it. You know, I have a host of sweaters that I think are stuffed away in a closet from the late 80s, early 90s that were just at the time, uh, you know, sweaters. But now I think they qualify as, as, as ugly sweaters. So if uh, anybody needs some help uh, finding one, I think I have a box full up, upstairs. Um, hitting aside, I, Jen, just to close, I was uh, reading. I've been trying to make my way around to our primary classrooms and, and reading with our students. Um, and I passed through the library today with Miss uh, Llewellyn because she's helped. She helps me select books for our kids, and uh, she had quite the selection that was 
seasonal in nature uh, today for uh, to help me out to pick a couple stories to share. And Miss Llewellyn and I were talking about the number of holidays or cultural celebrations that occur this time of the year, and um, which really are, are dozens. You know, we think of the uh, dare I say traditional ones like Christmas and Hanukkah. Uh, Kwanzaa and others, but there's, I think, something like 70 or more uh, different holidays uh, or celebrations of some sort, depending on your cultures. But Ms. Llewellyn had shared with me that they all share a common theme um, or symbols, I should say, including um, light as part of them. So you think of the lighting of the menorah or the lighting of the Christmas tree. And, and I, had, I said, you know, I, I don't know if I ever had realized that, uh, I mean, it's very evident when you think about it, but I don't know if I had ever realized that. And I asked Ms. well, why is that? She goes, well, it's the darkest time of the year, obviously the winter solstice being today. So this is a, a symbol of how we need to let the light in to our lives and you know, light being reflective of, of joy, uh, of, of peace. Um, and uh, that's why all of these uh, cultural celebrations typically include light as uh, some, uh, in some part of them. It's a very dark time of the year. I think we can uh, go a little bit further with that. Uh, you know, right now it's a it's not just a dark time of the year. You know, within the pandemic, it's a very stressful time of the year, as we were just speaking. And there's uh, very little uh, light at this time of the year, and there's the potential for there to be very little light in our lives. So I I hope that with the holidays upon us, uh, that we take the time uh, to celebrate responsibly, safely, with family, friends. Uh, uh, we have the time to laugh uh, and enjoy the many points of life, uh, of light in our lives, uh, and that our community uh, has such uh, over this next uh, week, uh, week and a half or so. Uh, so with that, Jen, I'll, I'll close and uh, thank you and the board and wish everybody uh, a very happy new year. Thank you. Happy new year to you. Um, I would like to make a motion to adjourn. May I have a second, please? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Okay. Happy holidays, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.